encourage everybody to come to our kickoff for growth groups uh, tonight at 5. Uh, the group that meets here will meet at 5 as well. But uh, even if you go to that group, you're welcome to come to Lundy and Beth's house at 5 where we'll have some appetizers and we'll have a devotional. And, uh, and then we'll watch the game. Uh, and so it's going to be a great time. Good time. And if you haven't been involved in growth groups, this is a good time to join. And we're going to have a good study uh, this, this, this term. We're going to talk about formation in small groups. How we just form in our small groups and how they work and how we grow in our spiritual maturity. And I hope you come to that as those will be good discussions during this semester. And so it'll be a good time. And so if you know anybody that may be thinking about coming to church, this is a good way to come, to come to small groups. It's non-threatening for people that may be uh, uncomfortable with coming to the church building, per se. And so, uh, so this is a good way. And so finally, just want to share this with you. Uh, this is a map of kind of like a long-term goals. Uh, I just call it the big scheme of things. <laughs> and so just look at it here if, if, if this makes sense here. I don't know if you can see that laser. So this is the house. Here's building two. And this is auditorium. I know that's obvious because this drawing is so precise and so good. But, uh, and so, and this is, you know, generally the list of things, how we're going to be doing things over the next few years. And we've already done a couple of them. Of course, we got the library and the teen room here, and we got this wall removed that was over there in the uh, in the uh, uh, office, the house. So a few things else we want to do. We want to put a baptistry here. That's our next thing to do: baptistry, and also to redo, uh, refit building number two, to put up some permanent walls up there. And so that's exciting. And then also uh, we're th thinking about and talking about uh, how we can put a new front up here to be connecting so we don't have to keep walking outside because I know that's a concern for, uh, for me and our sick with our kids, especially when it gets really cold. You know, you go to class, get them dressed up, come over here for 15 minutes, get them dressed back up, go over there. And so that's something. And then next is uh, maybe redo this wall there. And then we want to build a playground area either here or over here. Um, so we'll see how that works out. And then last... We're going to build a multi-purpose room that will have a nice kitchen and a really nice teen room um, and maybe like a little half-court basketball court so we can do a lot of things. And then whenever we can, maybe this spring, build a pavilion back here, a fire pit and stairs down to the pavilion and probably remove that fence there. So we can see that there's lots of plans that go into long-term plans. Uh, these things have been thought about, talked about, prayed about. Um, and so just appreciate all your support. And we'll be letting you know more specifically how it's going to work. So this here is going to change some. And uh, if you have opinions about that, uh, let us know. And you know what? Change and transition is just part of life, isn't it? And as we continue to move forward, uh, that's something we need to do. Because I think it would be encouraging when we have baptisms, as we've been having quite a few of them and we'll continue to have them, that you can be able to see them here. Uh, hopefully you're, you're a fan of that, and so we'll be doing that probably this year. And so just wanted you to know. If you have any questions about any of this, come to me or come to one of the elders, and we can answer your questions, uh, or we can get back to you if we don't know the particular answer. So it's encouraging. So today we're going to continue on the discussion of one of the parables. And this parable here is found in, in all the Synoptic Gospels as well. And uh, it's good in Matthew, but I like to read this passage in Luke. And what I want to focus on, I want to focus on uh, particularly th this parable. There's two parables here. One about the cloth that tears away when you try to put a patch on. And then also putting new wine into old wineskins. Okay? So here, we remind, remind you what it says here. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new. For they say the old is better. And so we really need to let the process happen. And to know that it does take a process. You know, people don't come to Christ fully mature. There's a process there, and we need to understand that. So I want to talk about this parable this morning. I appreciate Brennan uh, reading the passage. And uh, uh, bridge room, bridegroom, whatever it is, you know, we understand. It's, it's, it's difficult to read on the fly like that. 
I thought about preaching bridge room the whole time this morning, but I decided not to. He's not even in here, so I won't rib him too much about it. So uh, understanding the parable itself. So we definitely need to understand this. Because uh, as we talk about the parables, it doesn't do any good if we don't understand the meaning behind the parable as we try to apply it in our lives. Because if you mis- misunderstand the meaning and the historical implications, then it really can make a big difference how you try to apply it in your life, right? And there's a good example of this that I've had in my life. I used to take a, a group of, of college students to Mexico every year. So, you know, 70 or 80 people. And so it's good. You know, all college students and usually uh, I maybe have just one other adult besides me. I know the kids, not kids, college students were adults by age. But, <laughs> but when, you know, when you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, they're jumping from the second floor into the pool. It's like, oh my God. So it's interesting. So uh, one of the times, you know, it's hot down there because we go in May. Right after school gets out, we go for a week. Uh, and we always went to Pedros Negras which is right across the border from Texas, the southern part, the most southern part of Texas there. And, and uh, while we're going there, this, this particular day was really hot. And we had to keep, you know, a lot of water there. And what we do there, we would build uh, physical church buildings. You know, we would lay the, the uh, concrete blocks there. So we have concrete guys, we have uh, brick and mortar guys, and we have uh, usually mostly young ladies that would do VBS for the local kids. And this was in neighborhoods down there. And so it was time that, you know, we would keep drinking. It was a hot day, and we were running out of cups. Okay, we were running out of cups, and I was like, okay, I'll go get cups. And uh, the, the preacher at the time, his wife was from Mexico. She's from Mexico City, Patty. And I said, okay, and there's lots of places in the neighborhood, like a, a house. Part of a house would be like a store kind of a thing. I was like, okay, what do I need to say to, to get cups? And uh, I knew Yo Kiro, you know, was like, I want. And she said, how about cups? He says, okay, it's, uh, it's Vesos. I said, okay, Vesos, great. So I just went, I drove the, uh, me and I took a college student with me. We went there and uh, they stayed in the van just to make sure <laughs> everything's safe. And I was just going by myself, right? And I said, yo quiero Vesos. And she looked at me. I was like, yo quiero Vesos. And she was like, no, 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 no Vesos. I said, it's like, why? I was like, okay, whatever, you know. Maybe she has something against the gringo. And so I got in the van, and uh, I, I told the person, like, well, they didn't have any there. So I went to the next place, and, uh, you know, nice lady uh, walked, you know, w- was there. And I said, yo, quiero besos. And she was like, what? Okay. It's like, yo, quiero besos. And she, and, and she was like, no, no. And I was like, and I saw him on the shelf there. I was like, yo, yo quiero besos. And so what I found out was, I was saying Bezos, but, but she had told me that I need to say Vesos. Can you hear the difference there, Vesos, Bezos? It's pretty small. Now, if you know Spanish, you maybe you're already laughing about this. So what I was saying was, I want kisses. <laughs> okay. And, and I was kind of indignant, especially that first place I went to. I was like, I want kisses. <laughs> and that's why she was like, no, no. And so, and so the next one is, I want cups. And so it doesn't sound like a big difference, does it? Yo quiero besos, yo quiero besos. But the meaning was drastic. And the impression that I probably gave as I was driving away in a Church of Christ van was probably uh, life transforming for that neighborhood. It's like, yeah, they're building that church. Oh, I know about that church. Yeah. And so it's just interesting. And so we need to understand the language, the terminology that, that was used by the time of Jesus so we can really apply it in our life. Because if not, we'll embarrass ourselves <laughs> like I do so often. And so. And so it just lets you know a little bit about the parable. When, fine, when, when wine ferments, it lets off gases and causes the wine skin to stretch. Okay? And so that wine, you put it in, and just like any, anything that ferments, or you found out by old milk in your refrigerator or anything, it expands. So it would cause that, that new wine skin to stretch. And thankfully, leather stretches. New, new leather does. And so if new wine is put into an old wine skin that is already stretched, then there's a high probability that it's going to burst. Okay? Because that that leather's already stretched, you put new one into it, releasing its gases as it's fermenting, and the leather can't do it. 
and it breaks. And you lose the wine and the wineskin. And I imagine this probably happened, and, and maybe happened to some people every once in a while, that they use a wineskin two or three times, and thinking, you know what, maybe I can use it one more time. And, uh, and of course, it's embarrassing, and they lose everything. They lose everything. So we need to think about how we can apply this. And so the setting of the parable, this is very important too. Because understanding the parable, understanding the people that he's talking to in the moment is also important. Okay? So, in Luke 5, 17 through 26, he's healing the lame man, okay? And he had already told the lame man that, you know, your sins are forgiven. And the people are like, what are you doing? All right? And so Jesus says this to them. What's is easier to say? Your sins have been forgiven? Or to say, get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up and pick up your stretcher and go home. And so he did. All right, so that's happening. And all these things are happening right after one another. And then Colin Levi, Matthew here, okay? Uh, after, that, he, after that, so this is happening right after one another, he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi, Matthew, sitting in the tax booth and said to him, Follow me. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. Okay? So he's doing a lot of extreme things here. Healing the man, forgiving sins, and calling an IRS agent <laughs> to be his follower in a spiritual matter. Okay? How well would that go over? Probably not so well, right? Especially if it's someone that you knew. And then finally here, Jesus ate with sinners. He ate with sinners. And Jesus answered and said to them, Is it not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick? I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The, the, the Pharisees and the spiritual leaders at the time had had enough. How can you do this? You're spitting in the face of everything we stand for. Everything that we're upholding, our tradition, the, the image of what it is to be spiritual. You're spitting in our faces. It's embarrassing. And so Jesus gave this parable of the new cloth on an old tunic and the wineskin. So, what does it matter to us? And why Jesus told this parable to these guys? He really wanted them to understand that it's not going to, he's not going to be doing ministry like the old way. It's going to be different. Jesus was changing things drastically. Okay? And a lot of people were uncomfortable with it. He's going to be with the sick. Physical sick and spiritual sick. You know, at that time, the, the Levites, the spiritual people, they really kept distant. Remember, the old law, they had, they had laws about not touching someone who's sick or getting too close to them, and, and they were really unclean. And maybe they're sick for a reason. Maybe they've sinned in some way, and God had made them that way. And definitely with the lame man... That was seen as that way. So who sinned, this man or his father? Right? And Jesus is saying, I'm going to spend time with these people. I'm going to be with the sick. I'm going to allow people with leprosy to come to me. Drastically different. Drastically different. And he started a new way. What's referred early as the way. The early Christians were called those that followed the way. So it's new. It's a new way. And so Jesus isn't putting the new way in old wineskins. He didn't go to the, to the uh, religious universities and, and ask for a conference with all the professors there saying, you guys are so wise. You're doing so good. I, I want you guys to follow me. I want to start with you. I'm actually humbled to even talk to you. He didn't do that. So he didn't put the new wine into old wineskins. He didn't put this new spiritual transformation into people that were already transformed. To people that were already committed to the religious way, who knew the right way and the wrong way to do religion. So, the traditional ones, they wouldn't accept a new teaching. You can see that how the Pharisees reacted before this parable, right? Saying, Jesus, what are you doing? That's not the way you do it. Talking to the Messiah, talking to the Christ, the Son of God, that's not the way you do it. 
That's not the way you do it, Jesus. I, you know, I don't even... I like to tell you that. You're doing it wrong. So Jesus knew at the beginning that I can't trust these guys. These guys won't bend to my will. They're going to force me to bend to their will. And that's not the way this process works. If you try to put this new way of doing uh, Christianity in these Jewish leaders, they would just break. <laughs> and if it had broken the ministry, you would have lost them and the one, the ministry, right? So Jesus knew he had to choose new people. So he called new vessels for the new way. He chose people that aren't so indignant in the old way that would be open to his tutelage. So they call him rabbi. If you were to call those other guys, they probably want Jesus to call them rabbi. Okay, I understand you're the rabbi, but you call me rabbi too. They wouldn't have worked. So Jesus told this parable, and I imagine a lot of the guys, they understood what he was saying. It's like, we're not going to be included into the main going-ons of his ministry. So I imagine they got offended, which that was one of Jesus' hobbies, right, to offend the Pharisees. But so we need to think about this application here, the application for us. The new way is still the new way. We're talking about in that the uh, cornerstone class about how to evangelize. And Ben read a little statistic saying that usually the church is about five to ten years behind reaching out the most effective way. I mean, think about, you know, we've got growth groups, you know, it's, it's pretty exciting, dynamic. And if we were doing this 20 years ago, we would be on the cutting edge. But we've started growth groups. <laughs> and, you know, and I don't even know what, in what ways we're five to ten years behind. I don't know. And I don't know if we are right now. But that's just an example, okay? We don't need to be caught up in doing it the way that it was for the sake of doing it the way that it was. Like I mentioned a few weeks ago, that people aren't looking for the first century church as, as they are looking for the first century Jesus. And that's what Jesus was telling these guys. I'm not here to set up an establishment, a new hierarchy. I'm here to set you free. I'm here to let everybody know that everybody can be a, a priest in the way. See how transforming that is? How it makes the shackles and the chains come off of people that were held under religious prison? And sad to say, sometimes we can fall into that. Someone has a new way to reach out, a new way to, to express Christ. And it's not against the Scriptures in any way. And there could be a temptation to say, that's not the way we do it here. That's not the way my grandpa started this church. That's not the way grandma made that chicken souffle. I don't think there's such thing as chicken souffle, but you know what I'm saying. We don't need to stick to tradition for the tradition's sake. We need to let Jesus have his way. So when Jesus tries to have his way with you, what happens? Are you an old wineskin? And you push back? You feel the Spirit trying to pull you and change you in some way and you push back it's like no that's not that's not right that, that goes against to, to, from what's comfortable to me that goes against my tradition it goes against to what is going to be approved Jesus went against all of those because Jesus was about healing the spiritual sick that was his goal that was his goal I'm here to heal the spiritual sick and you're here to keep this hierarchy, this status, spiritual status, with other people. I'm not here for that. I'm here for you and them. And immediately there was conflict. And there was conflict through the rest of Jesus' ministry. Or are you going to be new wineskins? Say, you know what, Jesus? I'm willing to be, I'm willing to be flexible and change. I'm willing... As you come into me with the Holy Spirit and you challenge me, that fermentation process as I age and become good tasting old wine, 
I'm going to bend to you as opposed to force you to bend to me. Because sometimes we can react like the old Pharisees and say, no, no, that's not the way it's going to be with me. Jesus, you come and make some changes in me, and then I'm going to ex- uh, expect you to make some changes as well. I'll change, you change. You know, it's, it's a nice concept to think that I come a little bit, God comes a little bit, but what has God done? God's come all the way, hasn't He? We just have to accept. And He'll make the change in us. It's not 50-50. Do you really think you've done half of what it takes for you to become a Christian? I think that's preposterous to think that. God did it all. Until you understand that, and really let Him have His way with you, then you're an old wineskin. You can be a 20-year-old old wineskin. And you can be an 80-year-old new wineskin. You can. All it is is letting Jesus have His way with you. And you need to. And until you are a new wineskin, then you won't be able to hold the new wine. And maybe even to the point where Jesus and God, they won't even put new wine in you. Because you can't hold it. You burst and you lose the wine that He puts in you. I wonder if at some point God holds people back from a church, a church family, because they're not ready to accept new people. And then if they change, I believe we've changed and we're becoming loving. We already were, but accepting and really wanting people to come here. God and Jesus will say, you're ready. I'm going to send you people that you don't even know that are looking. (laughs) And I think that's happening some already. It'll happen more. And so we won't have to be surprised. I think we can expect that to happen. We don't need surprise. We say, that's the way God works. He's always moving, always active. And so the meaning for us, I want us to think about this quickly. The gospel must ferment in you and get in all of your pores. No, that wine skin, when that wine gets poured into that wine skin, it's in it 100%. It doesn't leave, okay, this part of the wine skin, you want to stay the way you were before I came in? Okay, you can do that. It doesn't work that way. All of it gets changed. It may not be completely visible from the outside, but the inside, all of it gets changed. And I want to let you know, all of you is going to be changed. And maybe probably multiple times throughout your life as you let Jesus have His way with you. Oops. And then after He has His way with you, then you will be seasoned. You'll be that seasoned old wine. That once people taste that old wine, they won't go back to the new wine. Once you become that seasoned, you can look back at how you were and think, that used to be a big issue to me. Or... I remember when I, I discouraged somebody. It takes time to become seasoned. You can't get seasoned overnight. It takes experiences. It takes sacrifice. It, it takes walking in the footsteps of Jesus for a while to become seasoned. And so we've, we've got different ways of setting up to help you to become old wine. And no, this isn't a, a, a lesson on you can drink wine, <laughs> okay? Uh, but we need to be seasoned. So by prayer, by, by being humble, with growth groups, with confessing your sins to one another, these are all tools in the toolbox of, of how to become that seasoned spiritual veteran. That when you share yourself with somebody, they can tell that you're a seasoned Christian. That you've got maturity about you. And this process continues to go on until the the end of our life here. So this parable of wineskins, Jesus meant this for the the traditional people that were having struggles with Him and also for the new people that were accepting His gospel. Because 
bringing in that IRS agent and going to his house and eating with a bunch of other IRS agents that have cheated and done us wrong. Are you okay with that? Are you going to say, no, Jesus, don't do that? Because the issue is here, we are Jesus to these people. That needs to be us that eats with them. That needs to be us that are with the sick. The spiritually sick. The physical sick. And not just try to hobnob with the spiritual elite. The people that are well-groomed. But the people that are so off-base that they need the doctor. That's us. Jesus through us. We reach out to them. So I want to encourage you to continue to be transformed. And this is a good uh, parable to, to think about as we start growth groups. That's why I picked this one. Because growth groups can be so pivotal in us talking, stretching us spiritually, so we can be more seasoned and, and more mature. Now, obviously, that wine is the gospel. That all of us, everybody, needs to come to Christ. If you haven't taken on Christ as your Savior, you need to do that. If, if you've allowed yourself to become traditional and not bending to the will of Christ, then you need to change that too. If you need the prayers of the church, please come forward as we sing this song.